Hello, everyone. Welcome to week three in SCP-271. We're going to go ahead and get started and review chapter two of the textbook, Social and Cultural Transformations and the Rise of Sport in North America. So the focus of this week is really to expand on our understanding of how sport evolved across all the different historical periods in the US, all the way from pre-colonial America up until today in the 21st century. So we're gonna be talking about a lot of the social and cultural factors that led to the creation of sport during those periods of time and the rise of popularity of sport in North America. So here's a quick outline of what we're gonna be going over. First, we'll talk about why is sport history so important? Why is it important for us to understand sport history? Then we're gonna go through each of the different time periods fairly briefly, um, mostly because you've read all of this in your book. And then lastly, talk about the early social implications of sport. So why should we look at sport history and the history of sport? Why is it important? Well, by looking at it retroactively, we can really see where sport was developed and how. We can see how sport was affected by the different historical periods, the social structures of those times, and see how different cultural conditions might have changed the trajectory of sport today. So let's start with pre-colonial America. Way before pilgrims came here to America, there were between six to eight million Native Americans spread throughout the country. And so physical activity was really important during that time. You can imagine why. During that time, a lot of the means to survive required men to be physically active, right? You were hunting your own game. You were making your own clothes, you know, needing to hunt even bigger animals for those things. Um, and so in order to be able to survive, you had to be physically fit. A lot of the games that came out of this time were very, very cultural specific. And these sports had encouraged the men throughout the tribe to remain tough, remain strong. And these types of competitions among the Native Americans, they used to determine who was the most superior of the tribe, right? This, there's a, a very masculine component to being able to play these sports and to come out on top. And so the most common sports during this time period were lacrosse, archery, and running. A lot of these go back to that idea that it's important to be fit in order to stay alive. And so these activities help them to do that. And so as you can imagine, there wasn't really any sort of organized sport in this. It was very much just a physical activity that tribes participated in. And they were usually men participating in these things. It's really interesting to see that lacrosse was actually the oldest sport in, in America. And so as we moved, and so as we moved towards colonial America, so when pilgrims start to arrive, we see a few similar things and a few different things. Europeans came here from wherever they came from in order to escape religious persecution. And so religious puritanism was, a, was established here in America. Um, religion was a huge part of why people came here. And so they wanted to be able to practice their religion. And so these religious beliefs really influenced what sort of activities were allowed and not allowed, right? What, which activities were socially approved or not in these religious social institutions. Similar to pre-colonial times, it was still really, really difficult to stay alive, right? And so hard work was valued among colonial Americans. It was considered religious to work hard and to be able to provide for your families. It made it very difficult to really get involved in any sort of physical sports, even though people still did. Um, there was obviously no formally organized sport yet at this time because it was difficult, but a few other common sports did emerge. Horses and horse racing became more popular as Europeans came and brought those over from Europe. They also brought over 
guns and rifles. And so shooting matches became an activity. And then we also saw fist fights and wrestling matches. So these physical activities were still occurring. And it's important to, again, also note that it was usually the men that were participating in these types of activities, right? Because women had a very distinct role in their culture. They would remain in the house doing the work of taking care of the family and the children. And so something important to note that I sort of alluded to earlier was this disconnect between religious social institutions and sort of recreation and play among the early North American settlers. Those, those sports that I mentioned earlier, horse racing and shooting, um, those things, those came frequently at the defiance of local laws, right? Because the religious believed that everyone should contribute to the colony and it was religious to maintain a continued work ethic and to contribute to the colony. Taking any sort of break to do any of these activities that were mentioned is um, violating those religious beliefs. Here we also begin to see the differences of activity between social classes, right? So essentially the higher social class were engaged in more of the fighting and horse racing type of activities. Um, this is probably due to the fact that social class, higher social class folks can afford horses. They've learned how to breed competitive horses throughout this time. And so they are able to participate in those types of activities. Taverns were also being used for card games, billiard games, and rifle pistol shooting. And here we also begin to see the racial implications of the development of sport, right? Black slaves usually are in charge of maintaining and taking care of the horses on the different plantations. And so they usually developed relationships with the horses and developed into becoming the jockeys for these horse races. Boxing also becomes popular during this time. It's usually the Black slaves who are the boxers, while white owners engaged in more of the betting. And so let's just take a moment to think about the sports during the pre-colonial times and the colonial times. We have Native, Native Americans who were into lacrosse, archery, and running. And then the sports in colonial America were horse racing, shooting matches, and fistfights and wrestling matches. So what are some commonalities between the development of sport in these two cultures? We discussed a lot of the need to survive during these two periods of time, right? So a lot of these activities have to do with being able to survive, showing how strong you are amongst your group, and requiring skills to be able to provide for your family. It's also common here that these are all male dominated, right? We don't talk about women really participating in any of these activities. And so in what ways can you see the foundation of modern sport being laid here? I would argue yes, right? We already, we see the male dominance in sport here. We talked briefly about the social structure and social status and how that really determines what types of sports you're able to participate in. And we will see that later on in the chapters. All right, so now we get into early 19th century. This is when industrialization happens. We have the technological revolution. And then finally, the, the start of organized sport in our culture. So let's start with the industrial revolution, which is the 1800s. All right, this time is getting us more and more closer to modern time, right? So here we're talking about factories finally being developed. Um, jobs are starting to form in these factories. So people start to move towards the city and the cities become bigger and bigger and thus urbanization happens. The economy becomes dependent on this industrial production and not so much in individualized development. So if we think back on pre-industrial revolution, those colonial times, everyone's, you know, producing their own foods, making their own clothes, um, all those things. And so 
instead of focusing on our own and our own things that we make in our own homes, now we are able to mass produce because we have factories. And so um, people are dependent on these productions in these factories. And with mass production, we have more jobs, people tend to have more money, and then with more money and comes more time. And with that, with more money and time, we get more free time to do recreation and to play sport. And so the common sports during this time period, again, we, we continue to see horse racing. Rowing becomes quite popular there, during this time. We have prize fighting and also foot racing. During this time period, we also see a transformation from just the occasional informal sport to more highly organized and actually having commercial spectators um, watch sport. And we see that begin during this time period. And there are a few reasons why that happens, mostly because of technology. This technological revolution occurs during this time. There's a development of technology and some of the more significant things to note is, is travel. Travel becomes faster and it becomes easier, right? Before, all you could really do is walk. Um, if you were wealthy enough to have a horse, then you might be able to get around faster. But during this time, we have boats begin to develop in steamboats, which at this time is incredibly fast compared to regular boats, right? So this occurs in 1807. It's a big deal for organized sport, but um, it, it allows people to obviously attend sport and go from one city to another, but it's not really helpful unless you live near a large body of water. But still, the ability to travel from one place to another uh, means you can participate in sport that is not just local to you. We also see communication gets faster with the invention of the telegraph in 1844. So this makes it possible to transmit scores quickly, get, get some news information, right? We see a rise in sports journalism because of this. The printing process becomes a lot easier and news gets to be traveled fast because of the telegraph. We have more people immigrating to the United States and thus bringing their own cultures and sports with them um, without, without religious restrictions, right? They're not coming um, because they're in religious persecution. They're simply coming because they want more opportunities um, during this industrial revolution time. And again, we, all, we see this rise of modern spectator sport, um, boxing, running, horse racing, all because of technology and thus people are getting more and more interested in sport because they're hearing about it more. And we, we definitely see that today. So again, new forms of transportation. Travel in the early 1800s, as you can imagine, was difficult and slow. Everything happened by horse pretty much, um, took days and days to travel. In the early 19th century, the steamboat engine was developed. We also had the railroad that was being laid. And this, again, just allowed for more easy access to sports, right? It eased travel to the different events, into the scheduling events. Um, people were able to either participate or even just watch. New forms of communication, the invention of the telegraph, dissemination of sport news was occurring because of this. Um, and then the printing press was also created. So newspapers, mag magazines, and periodicals. Um, you mentioned a lot of this already. Now, as we move into post-Civil War, 1865 to the 1900s, we see continued movement of people moving towards the West or into cities and into the larger cities. This is around the time of the gold rush. So everyone again is moving out west to towards California. And so the colonization of the West Coast is starting to happen during this time. Manufacturing continues to expand, which means more time, even more time for recreation. And so here we see this new working structure seen by many as the feminization of society. 
which means because of these factories and these manufacturing jobs, people were starting to feel that men were sort of losing their, their manliness, right? They weren't doing this hard labor anymore. And, and so they felt like they were turning into these more feminine roles, right? Where they didn't have to work as hard. And so sport was seen as a method to counteract this. And so during this time, men and boys were encouraged to participate in sport. And so here we see an increase in men's leagues and men's opportunities during this time. And really we can sort of foreshadow how and why women's sports get so far behind and how they're still even catching up today. So sport at this time um, is where we begin to see socioeconomic status really start to emerge and become problematic. Um, it cre creates different levels of access for certain people, right? And so here you can see some differences between class. Um, in the upper class, you see horse racing, yachting, lawn tennis. So, I mean, if you can even think about I don't really know what yachting entails, but yachts themselves are for the upper class, right? And so you can see how limiting that can be for the working and lower class people. Again, with tennis and golf, that is also usually associated with some sort of club membership that we see today, right? And so really still reflected today, these, these, um, these class specific differences between these sports. And so for middle working class, you see rowing and cycling. As you can see here, this was actually socially acceptable for women versus men here. The reason for that could be that um, these sports are typically not considered to be as physical as some of the other sports, right? And so it would be appropriate for women to be able to participate in, in these sports, um, even just wearing their typical dress, these would be considered okay or appropriate for women. And then we see working class men here at the bottom. Um, so the activities that they would participate in is pool, fishing, hunting, and then slowly adopted new sports of the upper class, right? So we'd start with these more, I guess what you would consider lower class sports, and then typically you'd eventually be able to adopt some of the other sports for working class. One of the most prominent examples of this is baseball, um, probably because it's pretty simple sport. All you need is a bat and a ball. There's not much else that you need in order to be able to play it. So a few other major technological de developments happen post-Civil War. We have the transatlantic cable laid in 1866, which allows us to communicate across the ocean, which is great. Improvement of camera technology in the 1870s tied to sports. So this may not seem like a huge thing, but you know, back then obviously it was very big, but now people are able to really see who athletes were, you know, take pictures of athletes, put names to faces of who they've read um, in the sports newspaper. So, so a lot of change happening there. The telephone was invented in 1876, and we all know how significant that was during this time. Another thing that we don't really think about or we take for granted, but the light bulb was invented in 1879. So thinking, thinking about it, really, you couldn't play sport past, past sunset, right? You can't play sport in the dark. And so um, the invention of the light bulb allowed for that to happen. So now there's more time to play sport outside. The colonial period saw the founding of its first North American colleges. Um, and eventually by 1852, we have our very first rowing matches between Harvard and Yale. And so clearly this was a social class issue, right? It's this modern roots of elitism where only these top institutions and people who are associated with these top institutions are able to compete and watch these types of official matches. College football becomes a thing 
Um, it's a very popular spectator sport for, again, for only for wealthy college students and alumni, right? So these, again, these schools, these Ivy schools, as we come to know them now, have really massive budgets, um, probably thanks to their alumni who donate things and how much support they get. And so they're able to afford having more and more sports. And so here we also see that winning becomes a measure of prestige for students, alumni, and the public. So here we really see the beginnings of competition between colleges. The next technological innovation that's happening in the late 1800s is the development and access of sport equipment. So, you know, earlier sports, everyone's making their own types of equipment, right? Um, you're going to build your own lacrosse stick with what you've hunted. You have bows that you're making or that somebody else is making. And then you have guns that you've brought over from Europe, but you're not really buying much up until this point. And so now people are more dependent on inexpensive and dependable equipment um, for in order for them to participate in sport, right? So if you if it's too complicated in terms of what you need to play a sport, it's probably not going to gain much traction during this time. Spalding, the company that we all know, began during this period of time and department stores began carrying sporting goods at a large scale around this time as well. So really you can get these sporting equipments anywhere you go. And with people having more money and now this access to this equipment, people are gonna buy that equipment and participate and um, sport participation is gonna grow during this period of time. Other technological breakthroughs. We have photography for analyzing movement. So I'm not sure how it compares to today's type of biomechanics and um, those types of video feedback. But again, this was a technological breakthrough during that time. Electricity, like I mentioned, um, allowed for night events to occur in, and for sport to be held in indoor arenas. Um, it wasn't until 1930 that the emergence of night baseball was a thing, so night games. And then we also have the um, evolution of rubber equipment, right, and apparel. So these more durable types of rubber allowed for more cycling and auto racing type events. Okay, so really quickly, some early social implications of sport that we can sort of see and foreshadow today. And this goes back to that feminization topic that I mentioned earlier. It's that the modernization of institutions of socialization um, changed traditional male roles and responsibilities. And so, again, leaders were worried that men were losing their masculine traits. And so they encouraged sport to, they encouraged participation in sport in order for them to develop into their manhood. And as you can imagine, the opposite was said for women, right? So women, if you participate in, if you participate in sport, you'll develop these manhood or masculine traits that you don't want. So you're not allowed to participate in sport. Physical activity, however, was something completely different. And so here we have this muscular Christianity and intellectuals who basically believed that poor health was a sin, right? If you didn't do any sort of physical activity, it was probably because you were sinning. And so there was this push for people to be more engaged in physical fitness the overall effort was to improve the physical health of the entire population. And so we had these religious leaders who were really promoting it. We had social reformers who were promoting physical activity and intellectuals. And so it really had a positive effect on the public who began to see that, yes, physical activity was important um, for our health and happiness. And so the profound changes that were happening because of these technological and industrial revolutions um, required some moral and social justifications, right? How were people going to survive this economic boom, this capitalism and new economic system that is controlled by 
private owners and all for profit? How are people going to survive it? How are how is this okay? What capitalists came up with were these two reasons. One is that money and success are rewards for those who work hard and who follow the rules. So as it's sort of this foundation of the American dream concept, right? If you work hard and you follow all the rules, then you'll be rewarded in this economic system. Another justification they had is social Darwinism. Um, and as you can remember, it's survival of the fittest. There's going to be competition and winning and whoever's the best is going to come out superior and on top. So it'll all sort of happen naturally and biologically. Those who are weak are not going to survive. And so finally, we get to the 20th century. Sport becomes the most dominant and pervasive popular practice, popular cultural practice in North America. The corporate industry starts to include sport and health. We continue to see improved technology and equipment. There's integration into the educational system in terms of sport, right? And we'll get to that when we talk about interscholastic sport as well as intercollegiate sport later on in the semester. Transportation dramatically improves due to the invention of internal of the internal combustion engine. So we have cars faster boats, trains, and planes. You can sort of see a pattern here, but we also see communication improve. We get the radio, television, and then the internet. And then sport, really, it no longer is just a high social stature thing. Everyone from all social economic levels start to participate in sport, and it, it just becomes recreation for everybody. And so that was your history lesson. Um, so what did we learn today? We saw today the rise of sport in United States and Canada. Despite natural and social barriers, colonists engaged in a variety of playful activities. Conditions favorable for organized sport emerged at the beginning of the 19th century. And we saw a lot of technological innovations, right? In the, uh, and in the industrial revolution, um, these innovations were instrumental in being able to um, give rise for modern sport and allow people to participate. And then lastly, sport becomes a pervasive part of life in North America during the first half of the 20th century. And we will continue this um, look at sport in the 20th century um, for the rest of the semester. So for this particular chapter, you'll need to know what are the key periods, generally what's happening during that period of time, and sort of what are the most important developments happening during those periods of time. So don't be too worried about any specific dates, not like your reading quizzes. So you'll need to know more about the patterns and be able to match up popular sports during specific times, okay? So thank you everyone. I will talk to you all next week.